feet and hands and an oversized head. And that's pretty much what he does. So, so he's, he's an early modern monster <laughs> creature. Called Tofukoi or Tofukoi. Um, he's, he's, he's in this class of creatures called yokai, which is a term you may hear in English Japanese popular culture. They're becoming more and more popular in the West. Monsters, spooks, I'll, I'll problematize what this term means a bit more. What this monster's deal is, is he appears on dark rainy nights and offers you tofu. Or <laughs> in some versions, he steals your tofu. And that's about it. I've seen some modern discussions when they're trying to say, well, you know, he'll feed you tofu and then he'll take you off and eat you. But in early modern stuff, he doesn't do that. He just kind of shows up behind me and says, would you like some tofu? And, you know, <laughs> that's a dark rainy night. That's kind of creepy. That's an episode. It's a giant bad piece of all does. <laughs> Um, he's often drawn with a big head. Sometimes he's drawn with only one eye, which makes him even creepier, but here he's got two eyes. Um, a lot of the yokai, the monsters, the only modern monsters that we'll be talking about, um, and that were and are still popular, have legends behind them, have textual pedigrees. We can trace them to a particular book that was written in such and such a year. It was based on the legends that circulated for centuries in this region. A lot of them have their backstories. I like this one, and I wanted to start with Tofu Boy because he doesn't have any of them. He first appears in the late 18th century, um, and he starts to immediately becomes really popular, showing up in all sorts of illustrated books, but we don't know who came up with him. There is no legend of Tofu Boy that dates back to the 8th century. This, this is not a thing. Um, at most, it was an urban legend, or perhaps People speculate there was a marketing game. There were tofu sellers, there were shops that made and sold tofu, maybe peddlers wandering around. So it could well have been a marketing game. This is why I like this character, because it's popular culture in every way that we think about popular culture. Right? He is a marketing guy. You can totally imagine a tofu seller coming up with a really cute, okay, maybe creepy um, mascot for their product. And ever after, you're going to associate your product with that mascot. Um, and that's certainly sort of what he becomes later after he becomes known. Whether he started that way, I'm not really sure. Nobody's really sure. Um, he did figure in comic books, though, and in fact, this particular image, here it is in context in a comic book that's kind of a compendium of monsters. So you can see him surrounded by other kinds of monstrous figures, some of which can be identified, and some of which are kind of just figments of the author's imagination. Um, there's not much of a story to this comic book. It's basically a... Um, here's all the monsters. I could read the particular lines. And this one, so we can read from right to left. So the boss of the monsters, the overlooker, that's how I translate this particular monster. He's Mikoshi Yudo, and basically he's, this guy here has an extendable neck, and he like, peeks over your balcony and creeps you out. And he does cast a A little bit fat like this. Um, so the boss of the monsters, the overlooker, appears and summons all these spooky cronies. The boss's grandson, big headed boy threatens tofu peddlers on Drizzly Nights so he can bring back a clock. So here, their explanation is that he attacks tofu peddlers so he can bring tofu home to the boss, but there's other ways in which he's treated. Um, I say comic book. So this, the title of the work this comes from is, I can read it better if I come get it to you guys, Pakemono Chak Tojo, or Monsters Reporting for Duty, um, published in 1788. <laughs> it's a very amusing work. I worked through this with one of my grad students years ago, we just had fun, you know, every page is like this, some more monsters. The, uh, the artist, guy named Kitaoshi Yamasa, a very famous artist of the day, was basically allowed to let his imagination for a while. But again, many of these pop up in various kinds of stories. Tofu Boy pops up elsewhere. The Overlooker is a standard kind of monster that you see in things from fear. Some of these other things are just kind of imaginary ghoulies, not meant to represent anything in particular. I see comic kind of the genre of book that this was is something called a kiyoshi, a yellowback. Uh, I call them comics. Other people who study them call them comics because they are visual, verbal, sequential narratives. If anybody here does comic studies, you know, you may object to say, well, this, there's no panels in this. This is the entire two page strike here, so it's not really sequential in the way we necessarily associate with comics. By some definitions, this isn't very comics -y, but other definitions of comics emphasize that comics um, have a particular relationship of visual and verbal element. So the fact that the text here and on other pages the dialogue is embedded right in the image makes it work like comics even if it's only one 
train, essentially, per page. So, you know, we can talk about these other kind of comics. They're similar to one of comics, too, but they're mass produced. Right, we're talking about 1788, very long time ago, but they're mass printed and sold. They were very popular. They were best sellers of the day. By the time we get into the 19th century, this was kind of the mainstream reading material for your average citizen of one of the big Japanese cities. Some of these were for children, like this one. Some of them were for adults, were much more complicated in terms of the story they're telling, in terms of the visual verbal interaction. Not all of them, of course, dealt with monsters, but a lot of them did. Monsters were a common theme. So, um, any questions about Tofu Warrior there? Here's one more iteration of Tofu Warrior. <laughs> this is a modern statue. You can go to a town called Sakai Minato, um, and if you go to Mizuki Shigeru Road, and I'll explain who Mizuki Shigeru was in a few minutes, but some of you have three out of your head. There are, so he did a lot of cartoons about mm -hmm. monsters, and there are statues all along the streets of this town, which I haven't been to yet, so I'm sure you someday to go there and take pictures of all these monsters, including Tofu. So there's a statue of this kid. Right? This stuff survives. Um, here he's got two eyes as well, and you can see the, the maple leaf. Right? Um, he has the normal number of those. <laughs> um, so what I'm talking about today, it's a couple of overarching points. Um, I teach mainly early modern Japanese literature and culture, so we're talking about the period between 1600 and 1868. I also teach um, contemporary things, modern things, and I also went farther. Um, I do teach popular culture of the modern and contemporary period. Not always, but usually when I teach it, I'm teaching it from a perspective of the early modern. That is, one of the overarching points I try to make with my students is that popular culture is not simply the phenomenon of the 20th century, or as many of them, or kind of say, the 21st century. Popular culture, they may associate popular culture entirely with superheroes and hip hop music, but popular culture that is things that a large mass of the populace enjoys, cultural products that are driven by mass demand, can take place wherever the preconditions are there. Right? So in cases of Japan, we have what many people feel comfortable describing as a popular culture as far back as the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, so that's one of the overarching points I try to make with students, try to get them to question what is popular culture and can we divorce the concepts underpinning it from the specific manifestations of popular culture with which they're most familiar. Um, and then a secondary point is that quote unquote traditional culture is no such thing. And for anybody who's studied history, this is you know, a standard idea in you know, contemporary historical discourse. Maybe the traditions are usually invented at some point in time, reified. Um, but for many students you know, that I encounter in my classes, this is a new idea. So they may look at something like Tofu Boy and think, oh, that's old. That's 18th century. 1788, the US was 11 years old. Am I getting my history right? I mean, that's a long time ago, right, for a 20 year old kid. Um, so they think that's traditional. And when we put something in the box of traditional, we tend to assume that it's monolithic, unchanging. It's always been that way. Then modernity comes along and takes off from tradition. That's when things start to change. Well, that's not the case at all. Traditional. There are changes, there are responses to historical exigencies, there are shifts and evolutions, and all that kind of thing for that period of work. Um, so I, I'm trying to make a larger point about quote unquote traditional Japan, which is particularly relevant to the period I study because since that's the most recent period of old Japan before Japan starts to modernize, that's what tends to get held up as the tradition. People are always harking back to 18th century, early 19th century Japanese culture as the old stuff against the backdrop which we need to find the new stuff, and so that helps students understand that even the old stuff was not static. Um, and another point that I think is important for students to understand Japanese popular culture of the modern contemporary period is how it is using the past, how it is using tropes, characters, ideas from early modern Japanese popular culture. Since Japan does have a popular culture that stretches back several centuries, aspects of it get recycled. And there too, we run into this notion of the tradition. Students are prone to assume that, well, I can see, you know, I can do this with other things besides monsters. We do this with geisha, kodazan figures, samurai. They assume, well, the samurai always means the same thing, and now we have it in contemporary popular culture. When in fact, that's not the case. I try to make the point that 
these tropes may have a certain light in the early modern period. That light is changed, they're reappropriated, reused, redefined in various ways in the modern period. With monsters, which is what I'm going to be doing today, we find that the early modern monster is still a popular trope in contemporary Japanese popular culture, used with full knowledge that this is old stuff, quote unquote traditional stuff, but it's used for a different effect used for a different meaning, and it's often used quite consciously to critique modernity, to resist modernity. Resist is a pretty loaded word, I'm not going to say it's overthrowing modernity, but it's certainly positioning early modernity against modernity in a particular way. Um, so that's kind of, uh, it's kind of the heavy stuff at the top. Let's go back to thinking about, oh, I guess I have to do a little bit more of heavy stuff. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about what I mean when I say popular, which I probably owe us so when I'm talking about popular culture in the early modern period in Japan, I'm talking about an urban culture, an urban commercial culture. So it's a culture that's centered in the great cities, uh, primarily Edo, which later becomes Tokyo, which during the 17th and 18th century was growing at a huge rate for a while in the mid 18th century. It seems like it was the largest city in the world. It later gets overtaken by the place. But we're talking a culture that is rapidly urbanized. Uh, Kyoto, Osaka, Nagoya, or some of the other mega markets that sort of really shape the period. It's a commercial culture. That is, we're talking about a culture that's cash based, driven by an urban commoner merchant class of bourgeoisie. This is something that is important when I teach this stuff in the context of earlier Japanese culture. We're not talking a folk culture. I'm probably using this term facilely. We're not talking about a culture that is passed on from generation to generation sort of a folklore process. We're also not talking about a culture that is um, created by artistic elites or patronized by political and economic elites. We're talking about a culture that is driven by market forces, as primitive, primitive as those market forces may be in the 18th century compared to what we are familiar with now. They're still driven by supply and demand. And they're they're mediated by sales, by money to you. Um, and I tend to argue with my students that this makes a definitive difference in the kinds of cultural production you see in the early modern period versus periods before this. And this is why it starts to feel, this is why those of us who work on this period get pretty as a stomach term, early modern. It's not pretty, it's early modern, because it starts to feel like modernity in some ways. It's not complete modernity, but it starts to, to feel familiar to us. And this is one of the reasons. Uh, we're talking about, I, I mentioned that it's, it's uh, mediated, it's mediated by me. We have, we have a print culture and a media taking place in this period. And what I mean by this is we have a, pr a printing technology, which by modern standards is not as sophisticated as movable type or printing or all the other, you know, computer printing and all the stuff we have now, but still it's sufficient to mass produce text and image. So basically you carve your text and image on a block of wood and it just like a stamp, you just ink it up and press it on a piece of paper and voila. But because you can reuse this you know, thousands of times, it makes it possible to mass produce books. Prior to this, Japan had been a manuscript culture. A book was a unique thing. If you wanted a copy of the book, you got to make a copy of the book, or you pay someone else to make a copy. But now, you can go to the store and buy books. Um, the genre of single sheet prints, like this one, that celebrates Kabuki action on stage, which is what we see here, is hugely popular. You're probably many of you are familiar with the concept of the pictures of the floating world. Here at a program on the African Caps collection, but yes, I mean, uh, uh, you have an okay collection as well. We have a lot of these here in Oregon to enjoy. A lot of these are stemming from the Kabuki theater. These two are mass produced. They're part of a generalized um, fan culture that's taking place. Kind of analogous, okay, to the you know, superhero plus figure son might put on the wall of his room. There are also uh, review books, not a systematized like monthly review of new plays, but you have books that are reviewing actors and productions of the upcoming season, or the season that just went past. You have a, a culture of people talking in print about theater productions. You have novelizations, you have high end, you have, I'm not quite sure the licensing details, but we have <laughs> comic books that are uh, depicting stories that are not taken from the stage, but they're borrowing Kabuki actors' faces for the characters that are acting in these stories. It's as if you're reading a Superman comic book. They just decided you can have it on the actors' face. Somebody somewhere is probably making a little bit of money off this, not exactly sure. 
Um, so this, these are kind of the general contours of what I mean when I'm talking about an early modern popular culture. It's, um, it's a mass culture, not an elite culture. It's mediated by print and performance media. It's a commercial culture and it's urban, but it's quasi-national and as the period goes on, it's penetrating farther and farther into the, the hinterlands. Um, what is the content of this popular culture? Well, there are, you know, we're talking about entertainment culture. Right? We're talking about stories being told and there are, you know, there's a huge variety of different kinds of stories, many in genres that would be very recognizable to us today. The details of who, who's whom, and how may change, but romance, you know, love and sex is an ever popular thing. There were romance stories, there were tragedies of various kinds, the specific social engines that drive tragedy may be different from Shakespeare, but the, the fact that in the end, half the people are dead and the other half are weeping, that's the same. Um, we get comedy. We get more comedy on the page than on the stage, but the movie plays tend to alternate between maybe to have a clownish scene followed by a tragic scene. So you have laughs. You have history. It may be very fanciful history, but you have great historical epics being presented on the stage, dealing with well-known historical personages. You have parodies. You have fantasy. You have magic, wizards, all kinds of things. You have crime. And you have horror, which is kind of my jumping off. But today, we have a popular culture that loves to scare people. That is, we have a populace that's willing to spend money to be scared. <laughs> They're willing to buy tickets to a theatrical production, which is going to send them home shivering. Uh, summer is the season for horror in Japan, dating from this period. So the kabuki troops would always put on horror plays in the middle of the summer. The idea being that it would chill you because it's hot as hell. So, you get so it's not an October thing, it's a summer thing. So this is actually a really good time to talk about this stuff. What am I talking about when I'm talking about horror? A wide variety of things, usually of a supernatural nature. So we have ghosts, that is dead people's spirits coming back, and there are various religious rationales for this, but basically the idea is that if a dead person is coming back, you get scared. Right? Uh, we have monsters of various kinds, that is corporeal beings, of various abnormal or terrifying shapes that would be distinguishable from ghosts. We have gods and demons and wizards. That is, we have supernatural beings that aren't monstrous in the sense of being, you know, malformed like Topo Boy, but still have powers and perhaps a certain amount of malevolence. Gods, as presented in horror stories, sometimes the line between a god and a demon can be kind of thin, so a god, you know, all that power, potentially scary. We have shape-shifting animals. That is, animals that are otherwise familiar to us, such as foxes or the one we'll talk about later, Hanuki, a kind of badger-like creature, who you could see if you are out in the mountain, but who are reputed to have magical capabilities that you know, people come back from. And say, I swear I saw a Hanuki shapeshift in front of my eyes, right? Um, <laughs> that will play tricks on you and make these fall into this category as well. Then you have animate objects. Um, you have things that were, um, there was a folk belief that if any object had been used for a certain amount of time, 99 years is one, one, um, one number given as a myth. Anything that had been around for too long had the potential to grow sentience and start walking around it. Which is kind of silly. So you often have animate objects appearing in sort of quasi horror stories or monster contexts. All of these kinds of things come into the category that in the modern period is called yokai. This term yokai, um, it started to make its way into English among people who are interested in Japanese popular culture because it doesn't equates 100% to any of these. It can include ghosts and monsters, which are kind of mutually exclusive categories. Um, and it can include, depending on the context, gods or demons or even wizards. Yokai is kind of this catch-all category for anything spooky that might potentially show up in a horror story. Um, so I'm just going to use the term yokai, but keep in mind that it could be all of these things. Um, how are these things used? So we have this category of yokai, which stems from horror, the, the supernatural, the uncanny, the unkindness, if you want to go for any on it. How are they used? Well, I'm going to give you several examples of how they were used in the early modern period, and then I'm going to finish off by giving a few examples of how the same creatures are used in modern contemporary Japanese Well, the most obvious way is as horror, right? That is, when I say as horror, they're meant to so stories that were told using these kinds of creatures that were meant to give you nightmares, meant to make you cuss the person sitting next to you in the theater seats. And the classic example, the most famous 
play of this type was called the Yotsuya Hor or Yotsuya Kaidan. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a clip of this to show you that is of the play originates. It's the most famous Kabuki horror play, but for some reason, I have not seen a DVD or a YouTube uh, version of an actual performance. So I have clips from film versions of this that I'll show you later when we get to talk to you about modern treatments of this, but really modern. The best I can do is summarize the story for you and show you this famous and really amazing image, which depicts them all. So this is a Kabuki play that premiered in 1825, uh, fairly recent, for those of us who work on the uh, Edo period. Uh, it concerns a samurai named Iemon and his wife, Oyo. Um, Iemon is a samurai, so we might expect him to be, we believe in all of the popular culture myths about samurai, we might expect him to be honor of all, upright and moral being. In fact, he's a he's cad, to use a nice Victorian word. He, uh, he poisons his wife, Oiwa, so he can marry her. He's this type of guy. He sees an opportunity to marry the girl next door, whose father is rich. He looks at Oiwa, who's poor, and he says, well, I can do better. So he poisons her. Um, the poison he gives her doesn't kill her, it disfigures her face. And then he leaves it to somebody else to kill her. Why he does this is never quite explained. It seems like it would just be easier to kill her, but it makes it much more horrific when we see her face disfigured as she wanders around the stage, still alive, not knowing why Iamon has done this to her, while well, one side of her face is kind of falling off and her hair is falling out. And then later, she dies and she comes back as a ghost to haunt Iamon to his death, her revenge. It's really, really awesome. Among the many ways she manifests herself as a ghost to Iamon is as this lantern. So people use these big paper lanterns, I'm sure you've seen them in, you know, in various restaurants and whatnot, with, you know, little lanterns. Land inside because these are made of paper, if you the wrong way, they could catch fire and burn up. Well, one of the stage effects of this was to have this big lantern on stage that would catch fire and immediately manifest, it, manifest itself as her face. So she's glaring at him from a flaming lantern and he's totally freaked out. Well, this becomes a, a really, really famous image from this play. Just universal and it's still widely recognized today in the toys of this moment. This is a particular depiction of it from 1832 by a Osaka artist in Kukue, depicting a particular kabuki actor as Niamon with the effect I've seen. If you go to the Edo Tokyo Museum in modern Tokyo, they have a little mechanical diorama that demonstrates some of the effects that were used in original stages of this. And there's a, a YouTube clip of that that someone took on a cell phone. We cannot make anything out at all, so I'm not going to bother to show it to you. But they had ways to do this kind of magic in the theater. So this becomes an indelible image. Now, I'm not going to pursue this particular strand, but you can see in Oyoa and several other female ghostly villains of the time, clear ancestors of some of the dominant tropes in contemporary Japanese horror. Some of you might have seen the movie Grudge or The Rain that were so popular about a decade ago. That idea of the vengeful female ghost often was something physically unnatural about her, like broken arms or broken neck or something like that, coming back to haunt, has just been part of Japanese popular culture ever since. It doesn't start with them, but this is a huge, um, huge influence on that genre. So this image is meant to scare us, right? Even this print, right? Because it's static, we might take other kinds of delight in it, admiring the artist's use of shade or composition, but still fundamentally, it's a scary image. So these things were used for horror purposes, but that's kind of the most obvious. And for me at least, the least interesting way in which these were used. In the early modern period, they were used in a lot of other ways. They were used, well there's a very interesting book that came out a few years ago called Pandemonium of Prey. This is the most scholarly work so far in English on the yokai phenomenon in early modern Japan. And uh, the author, um, Dylan Foster um, makes the point that these were fascinating to these, these yokai were fascinating to philosophers and scholars of the 18th and early 19th century as well for very different reasons. So there was this boom in yokai in the late 18th and early 19th century that touched popular culture, but it also touches elite culture. People are starting to think about these things well. This is the obvious philosophical question do they exist? That is, I mean, this is kind of a an entertaining way of asking, is there wonder out there in the natural world? Or are animals just all not animals? What happens 
when we turn our backs on a fox? Does it really shape shift? It would be really cool to think it does. But what does it say about our world if it doesn't? Right? Or what does it say about the concept of life after death if there are ghosts or if there aren't ghosts? There are very serious philosophical treatises written in the period jumping off from questions of monsters. Um, they become objects of historical or literary. Um, as people start to trace down sources, where are they written about? I mentioned the Tofu Boy doesn't have a genealogy. So there are genealogies for some of these other monsters, and people track them down. It's part of a general taxonomical or philological turn in the culture of this period where people are trying to make sense of the past. You know, the burgeoning print culture means that now we have access to what uh, one scholar called the a library of public information. So all of this information that might have been locked away in archives, all of this lore that might have only been accessible to certain um, certain members of an elite with access to the right archives, now becomes accessible to any smart person, literate person who just wants to know something. You can learn something. And so people start to learn about the past and put it together in new ways. And it's starting to feel it's not a total you know, age of enlightenment in the Western sense, but it's groping towards that sort of thing. It's fascinating. So they answer this encyclopedic impulse in early modern Japan. Um, and so we have this, this really famous influential book called The Illustrated Night Parade of a Hundred Monsters, or Ezio Kakiyagyo. It comes out of four volumes over a period of a, uh, almost a decade by an artist named Toriyama Sekian. This, sort of, this project sort of evolves as it goes, but it starts out as basically a series of pictures of monsters. He's basically creating a bestie of you know, just a pretty straight picture of a monster and his name. As the series goes on, he starts to work parodic things into it. He starts to make up monsters that have hunting relationships to real life uh, phenomena. But at first, it seems like he's just documenting these are the monsters that exist, exist in quotations. These are the monsters that we have talked about in our culture. Let's look at them, let's put them all so here we have a couple of examples, which are uh, a couple of my favorite examples. I mentioned the tanuki. So this is because this is taken from an old copy. You can't see too well what it looks like, but it's basically a badger-like, I think, uh, taxonomists call them raccoon dogs. They kind of like to cross between a raccoon and a badger, not with a bunch of dogs. Um, it's a real animal. You can still see them in the mountains today, but they were reputed to be tricksters and shapeshifters. So here he gives us a picture of a tummy can of hind legs staring up at the moon and kind of a garden at night. It's not meant to be horrific. Really, it's just, this is a tummy. You've heard about them? Here's a picture. The one above is a little bit more horrific. This is a Um And there's no explanation of what this is, but other um, sources from the time tell us the lore about what a Ubume was. Um, it's the ghost of a woman who died in childbirth who comes back haunting crossroads with her dead child at her breast, um, attacking people, attacking other women, ripping the children out of the wombs. It's a pretty horrific sort of thing. Um, so you just have the picture. The, you can tell it's a ghost because there's no feet off in early modern. Ghosts are drawn with no feet, and that's the tip off of the ghosts. But she has the child at her breast. It's spooky. But at the same time, it's not telling us the story. It's depending on us to know what the story is. It's just cataloging. We have these figures. But other people did still other things. So Sakian is kind of kind of taking them straight, almost in a scholarly sort of way. Other people will use them for fun and names, for laughter. Here we have a board game. We actually have a copy of this board game. Town of the University of Oregon. This has been widely reproduced in publications I've seen it in museum exhibitions. A board game. So Woodblock I did um, pretty big about this why about this this, uh, about this high. You would have bought the board and supplied your game pieces and dice. This one was published in 1858. It's kind of a board game called Suburoku. The, the rules are really easy. Basically, there's a start square, you put your piece down here, you roll the dice. There's a block of instructions on each square that tells you where to go if you roll that particular number. And you jump around the board, maybe start by number you roll, hoping to land on the top space, which is the end space. Um, these boards were printed with various kinds of motifs. This one um, shows a bunch of monsters. So it's taking the idea of these yokai. This is almost a catalog of yokai in the same way that Sikian's book was. Right? Here we have them all brought together as spaces that you can move through while playing a game. Um, but of course, it's meant to be 
fun for the kids who are playing this game. And it's probably kids who are playing the game. We have here in the start square, can't really see it too well, but a bunch of kids gathered around in a circle while one of them goes to blow off the lantern and get his the gathering together to tell scary stories in the middle of the night. And as you, the child, play this game, you are encountering the figures in the stories. Um, it's a particularly fun board because it has so many of the various kinds of monsters we've already met, even in this brief lecture. So here we have the overlooker, right? We have this guy who's wearing this is long neck. We have Boywa, right? The face burning through the lantern here. We have Tanaki here. We have, who is this fellow we have right here? Long neck. We have a long neck. And this guy here, we recognize this guy. We have a little tofu boy, right? Here we have, right? So I love this tofu boy. Um, he seems to have normal toes here, but he only got one eye. He's got a really long tongue. Why he's sticking at his tongue, we don't know, but he's gotten a little spooky here, right? But so this is, this is plainly fun, right? So these are horrific motifs, often drawn from, as in the case of Oiwa, you know, stories I wouldn't want you know, my kids to go and see when they're too young, but they're all being folded into this general atmosphere of playfulness, cartooniness in the way that they're presented. Some of them are pretty gross. This one here, you can't really see, it's kind of a greenish monster standing by the entrance to a public bath. Um, it's an akaname, and what these do is they lick filth from a public bath. Up. So it's, it's more gross than horrific, right? But that's what they do. They lick filth at public baths. So they just kind of hang around. I mean, they might be handy to have around. Then you don't have to scrub the tub. I'm not really sure if you can say, lick that filth right there. But, but they're pretty gross, right? Because the whole thing is fun. So we have Tofu Boy here. And this idea of fun, this idea of these monsters being used for comic effect is, as we'll see, I think this is why they have such staying power. Because they're not just scary, they're funny, they become... Um, adorable figures that people identify with. So to illustrate this, I want to zoom in a little bit more on the tanuki. So I mentioned that here we have a close-up of it. You can sort of see its badger-like body. Again, a real animal would have been familiar to people living in villages, less so to people living in cities. Reputed to have shape-shifting abilities and to be tricksters. They love to, to make mischief for humans. Not true malevolence, but you know, dangerous. Oh, and the other thing about Tanuki is they are reputed in legend to have really, really large scrota, which they can stretch. Uh, sorry, I should, I should warn, trigger warning, we're getting into slightly off-color part of the presentation, but these animals, you don't see them here, but they're supposed to have super large scrotal sacs, which they can stretch out into all sorts of shapes. We're going we're gonna to spend a little bit of time on this today. Please forgive me. Uh, I told you I was going to keep it light for after lunch. <laughs> so, for example, so here, you know, we don't see them here because Sekian, the encyclopedist, is very serious now. He's presenting these. But a little later, we get a print artist named Kuniyoshi who's going to do a series of prints of all the different things that Tanuki can do with his scrotal sack. So just, just take a moment and appreciate it. It's really fun. It's fun stuff, right? So if you're up it, you can use it as a net to catch fish. It's really convenient. You can hide it out as an umbrella on a rainy day. You can use it as a net to catch birds with it. You can put, you know, fake eyes on it and scare the local peasants. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's like a two dozen of these. These are, these are magnificent, right? You can be a ferryman, right? You can run out and so you've got the ferryman coming to you here, smoking his pipe, dragging people down. You can use it as a roof when you set yourself a really fortune teller. So this is hilarious. I mean, yes, it's just painful. People are a whole lot of ways to think about this. But what is he doing? I mean, he's having fun with this this you know, mischievous, yokai-like creature. But he's also parodying familiar activities. Not all of these are familiar activities you would have seen every day. I don't know about this scaring the peasants business, but these others, you know, fishermen, bird catchers, fairyland fortune tellers, were all of them familiar occupations that you would encounter every day in the villages of the cities. And so he's parodying all of these occupations by transforming their familiar tools into Tamaki's balls. <laughs> um, he's having a lot of fun, kind of an adult fun with this, but he's having fun with it. And there was a huge amount of this kind of yokai related material produced in the 18th and 19th centuries, of having all sorts of parodic fun with them. I want to introduce one more example of early modern 
uh, yokai pairing. So this is another comic book coming back in the realm of Yoshi. It's called Brian and the Monster, um, Bakemoto no Yomi. You can also translate that title as The Monster Takes the Bride, or Bridezilla, all of that sort of has different connotations entirely. Because it's not that the bride is rampaging through this, it's that every character in this archetypal, archetypical wedding story is a monster. So this is from 1807. And it tells, they don't really characters in this, it just tells the archetypal marriage story from first meeting to formal arrangement, betrothal, exchange of gifts between two families, the ceremony of the wedding itself, on through the birth of the first child, the burial of the boy, an heir to the family, and the presentation of this heir at the local shrine. There were, this was a common setup for children's stories, a very didactic setup. You can really easily imagine how this sort of children's story is meant to teach kids what they're supposed to do in later life, to expect that your mission in life you know, is to marry the person your parents choose for you to marry, and then produce an heir if you're a wife, or you know, sire and heir if you are a husband. Right? So there's lots of stories there, and there's lots of variations of this kind of children's story using different kinds of stuff. Uh, one that's been translated for all the participants in the drama are mice, which is really cute. Um, this one, they're all monsters, but this one, is a little bit more aimed at adults. You could read it as a kid, and it's just telling the marriage story, but there are also these wonderfully erotic elements. Um, here we have the bride and groom, who are both monsters of some kind of unidentifiable kind um, on their wedding night. They're sharing their last touch before they retire, and I'm not going to translate what they're saying, but he's making lewd comments um, that the groom is. Let's stay down here. Unidentified as a monster, I, I want to think this is Topher sitting in front of him because he looks so much like Topher Lloyd, but the horizontal slicing makes me think it's probably something else. It's probably a set of nested trays. But he's definitely a Topher Lloyd like figure. And there are all sorts of wonderful, dirty jokes embedded in this illustration. I mean, he has oversized thong as he's staring at the bride and the bridegroom. Of course, bride and bridegroom connotes imminent sexual activity, right? So then we have the paired pipe and tobacco pouch, which is a well-known set of erotic symbols, the thing that gets stuck in, the thing that things get stuck in, too. I mean, there's all sorts of subliminal symbolism happening in this image, which makes it more for those days. Setting it in the world of monsters to create this fun, jovial atmosphere. We have this wonderful use of monsters later to, I, know, I guess we're parodying the traditional marriage story. So here we have the child of scene which again is the reviewer in these wedding stories. Um, in this particular case, the childbirth has happened in a graveyard because monsters, right? Monsters like to hang around the graveyards. But look back here among the broken gravestones at the side, that's supposed to be the mother. And she's sort of dressed as a woman in childbirth would be dressed, but it's not back and forth for a moment. We've got the mother amidst gravestones in a graveyard having given birth. And are we talking, it's going to get really serious, are we talking about death and childhood? Are we using these humorous monsters and this traditional marriage story to, in a very sort of sneaky way, remind adults what they already know, the childbirth is a very dangerous process, and suddenly the, the jokiness of having everything in monster world be set in graveyards gets really serious? I mean, this is, this is possible, and I think it gets even um, reinforced by these midwives down the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. This guy. That little box series looks sort of like that. It does, right? That's what makes me think that that other set is a bunch of nested trays maybe contains food. This guy's a physician. Uh, this is a set of these nested trays containing various kinds of medicinal herbs and whatnot, and sitting there grinding it out. This is a traditional feature. Traditional, I shouldn't use that word. He's a, he's a fixture of these kinds of childbirth scenes. In all of these stories, you always have the physician over the corner who's going to save the day by prescribing the right medicines to mother just giving birth. If she's already dead, he's useless, which is, I think, part of the satirical or parodic element of this particular scene, right? He's there. He obviously did doing really good. And we have these two monsters over here who are bathing the new baby. They're midwives. And interestingly, the word for midwife, ubume, is a homophone for the ghost monster of the woman who dies in childbirth, which is also called an ubebe. They're written with different characters, so that is, they're spelled differently, but they're pronounced the same. So here, too, I think we have this whole sort of gamey, playful application of 
this horrific ghost that I talked about earlier of death and childbirth. Um, this same work concludes with another satirical element, um, presentation of the new baby at the shrine for its first blessing. Notice the mother is nowhere to be seen, which I think reinforces the idea that perhaps she died in childbirth. Um, so presenting the baby at the shrine to be blessed. In this case, the priest is an animate object. So this is a kind of wand the priest would use as part of this. So in this case, it's not a priest, it's the wand itself has come to life. But there's this wonderfully vicious pun going on here. Um, and what's being said, he chants, purge, purge, purge your purses. He's punning on harao, which is a verb for to expel, or to bless, or to drive away the spirits, but also harao means to pay. So it's basically reminding us that you know, priests do what they do for money. It's reducing everything to you know, pay for pray sort of situation. And they have this kind of thing worked into the world of the children's monster story. You know, it's funny. So I guess what I'm getting at here is that we've had various ways in which monsters are being used in the early modern period. Yeah, horror to sad. I think that's my answer. Um, I just noticed it's mostly in Hiragana, right? Yes. And so it's clearly for the popular... Exactly. Or exactly. is it just yeah. for children? It seems a little weird for children, this story. This one does, yeah. I think this one, this one, um, I've looked at quite a bit and other people. I think this is mimicking the children's story, but to make some very adult points. my drawing out these ideas. But this genre, because it had its roots in children's literature, it's written in a more accessible way. Um, so yeah, so it's very interesting to notice that instead of a lot of very difficult Chinese characters, it's written mostly in the syllabic characters, which would have been much easier for most people. Um, this is another thing that marks this as a kind of popular literature. It's meant for people without the highest level of education. Yeah, I saw another hand. Yeah. You see that a lot in stuff from the street. Even in books that are unmistakably meant for kids, there are jokes in there that are really aimed more at parents. And so you can imagine you can imagine them being meant either for like a dual audience like that, for people to come back to later in life, or for parents to read to kids and they'll just think to themselves, well, I'm not going to read them that joke. Um, <laughs> but I will enjoy this myself. Um, this one, I, could, I mean, I think if you, if you just ignore the, the text, kids would enjoy this. I mean, these are really entertainingly drawn monsters, I think. And a lot of, you know, I don't think a kid would pick up on the hints of death and childbirth and the, the more macabre elements of that. So um, I think I have enough time left to pivot and start talking about some modern stuff. I could talk about 18th and 19th century stuff all day, but I really want to show how some of this stuff gets repurposed in the modern period. So um, to sum up, I think I've tried to, to point out that in the early modern period, we have this culture of yokai. That is, we have this, this well-developed pantheon of monsters, ghosts, various kinds of ghoulies that are used in a whole lot of ways in the 18th and 19th century. It's used to scare you used to make you think, um, used to make you laugh, and maybe even to make you laugh in a more satirical sort of way, making fun of, of power centers in society, such as priests. Um, what about in the modern period? Well, this stuff survives. I mean, now I'm going to show you some things that we actually have moving images of. Um, a lot of this stuff survives. That is, this stuff is still used. Much of the things I've been talking about, many of the, the characters, um, the images are still features of modern and contemporary Japanese popular culture. How is it used? I want to finish off by talking about various ways in which these early modern monster tropes are used in modern and contemporary Japan. I'm going to start off with the same way they were used in the early modern period, which is horror. We still have, not all, but many of these things being used in sincere horror today. I don't think anybody tries to scare anybody with Tofu Boy these days. But they do try to scare each other with Oiwa and Iemo. So we've had lots of film versions of the Yotsuya horror. Um, that basic setup is kind of eternal, right? Wicked husband disfigures wife, kills wife, wife comes back to haunt husband. As I, as I say, this vengeful female ghost figure comes back again and again in various, uh, various contexts in contemporary Japanese horror. But the story itself gets retold because it still has resonance. So I'm going to show you, actually, 
um, a clip from a 1959 version, actually a trailer for a 1959 version. I don't have a really good clip to show you, but if I just show you the trailer, I think you'll get a sense of the way this is being presented. This is a pretty straight rendition of it. It's fairly faithful to the stage play. It's set in the early 19th century. It's directed by a fellow named Nakagawa Nobuo. Um, this is kind of intermittently available in English. I think I got my English subtitled DVD copy from Hong Kong, but it plays just fine. Um, let me show you the trailer of this. Unfortunately, in this version, they don't show the lantern scene. I, again, I haven't been able to find the lantern scene, even though it's such a hugely uh, popular image from this play. People don't like to film it. Um, so, yeah, this gets filmed straight. It also gets filmed um, in other ways. Um, just last year, a new film came out. I'm not going to bother to enlarge this because I'm going to go back and show you the trailer for this one. Um, there was a new film that came out just last year called Kuime, which translates to Devouring Woman, but the official English title is Over Your Dead Body, which is <laughs> um, It's directed by Mike Takashi, who, if you're into Japanese film, he's a, he's a very famous, super gory contemporary Japanese horror director. Um, he did Audition, which I have not been able to stomach watching so then. Um, so this one actually stars a kabuki actor. So the lead role is played by a guy whose main job is to act on the kabuki stage. Um, and this is a fascinating version because it interweaves two stories. It interweaves the story of actors, including Abuzo, um, who are rehearsing for a uh, staging of the traditional Yotsuya horror story, with those same actors having affairs with each other and, and coming inside a psychotic community. Murders. So we're sort of doubling the stage murder story with the contemporary murder story, which is sort of living out the events of the stage play. Um, I hope this, I know this played at a film festival in Toronto last year, so I'm hoping it will be released on DVD here soon. Um, I'll show you the trailer for this because it's pretty... The, the, the interesting point here is how it's, it's showing these traditional horror tropes surviving into modernity. What's going on? I mean, it's a little bit difficult to tell from the trailer, but what I find fascinating about this one is that it's it's both preserving the original horror show, right? that is, it's presenting these events for their horror impact in kind of the same way they would have been presented for their horror impact um, in the early modern period, but by highlighting this contrast between modern actors putting on this pre-modern play, but living out the same sort of events in their own lives, it's, it's doing something with the past, right? It's saying something about the recurrence of human behaviors from one era to the next, right? And it's pretty easy to see how this is doing that. And that's the, the keynote that I want to sound for the- Mike here is specifically mobilizing an early modern horror trope to say something about modernity, which is that maybe human beings are not much different now than they were in the past, right? Human beings, men can still kill women and brutally horrible fashion, just like they did in that era, right? So that, that seems to be, like there's a meta commentary going on in there. I've said several times, early modern yokai survive into contemporary popular culture. Often they're used just because they're cute and they're still cute, but often they're used in something similar to this way, to say something about modernity, to be, to be, they're used in full cognizance of the fact that they are popular culture figures from the past that can be mobilized in the present in a certain way. This is the last really gross thing I'm going to show. Um, probably the most famous exponent of this in modern Japan, let's keep the lights off because I have a couple more clips to show, um, is this manga artist named Mizuki Shigeru. He just died last year, his dates are 1922 to 2015. Um, extremely famous, one of the real giants of Japanese comics. Um, and he was best known for his use of Yoka. He did comics on a whole lot of genres, including semi-autobiographical stories about his experiences as a soldier in World War II, but he's best known for using yokai. Lots and lots of comics about yokai. His most famous one is this one, Gegege no Kitaro. Um, Gege is kind of a pun. Shigeru's childhood nickname was Gege from Shigeru, but Ge is also the sound you make when you see something really gross. So I think there's kind of an overlay of, ooh, gross, it's Kitaro. So Kitaro is this kid here. Notice the one eye. He's not Jofu Boy, but is I think? 
in a similar sort of vein as those uh, sometimes one-eyed creepy kids. So he's a boy who lives in a graveyard and associates with monsters. It's basically a children's story manga. His father is this disembodied eye. Why is he just an eye? Well, he gets um, he just <laughs> wasted away until he was just an eye. Um, his father bathes in a soup bowl. Sometimes he hides in his son's empty eye socket. Um, his friends include all sorts of other kinds of traditional yokai and modern monsters. He's living in the present day. So this milieu is very clearly the milieu of like that game board that I was showing you of cute early modern monsters, but they're living in contemporary Japan. And they're available for kids. So if a kid has a problem and he puts a letter or she puts a letter in the monster mail, special mailbox they at school, it will be delivered to Kitaro and Kitaro will come help out in a sort of a monster way. This is hugely popular. Everybody in Japan knows Kitaro. Um, there were lots of different comic versions, um, at least five different TV anime or animation series um, from 68, 71, 85, and 67. There are feature films made out of this. He's about as ubiquitous as Snoopy. He's super popular. Um, but here too, Mizuki is using the yokai milieu kind of for fun, but I think he's also saying other things with it. To sort of illustrate this, I'm going to show you just the couple minute opening sequence from the 1996 version of the animated series and uh, talking about Pan-Asianism. This is the only version of this theme song I was able to find on YouTube and it's been overdubbed in some language that nobody in the comments seems to be able to identify. Some people think it's Cantonese, other people think it's Latin. So if anybody recognizes the language this is being sung in, please tell me. I have no idea. But the animation behind it is the point. So it's just kind of the opening credit sequence for the TV series. I see the point, right? I mean, the point, at least the point I want to make about this, is um, notice what kind of scenes we have. It's clear from the, the monsters and from Fellow's house that we're supposed to be in the early water. Right? These are early water monsters, clearly drawn up from sources like I've been showing you. But look what's in the background. Modern skyscrapers of Tokyo. This is a well-known feature of Mizuki's work, and he's talked about this himself. Basically, one of the things he's trying to get across with this series is the is kind of putting the lie to the official story of modern and contemporary Japan, where everything is progress, everything is new, shiny, gleaming, and modern, high tech. Um, he's trying to remind us that you know, if you look, you can still find pockets of, of grime, of poverty, although he's not really serious about poverty, but of low tech, a smelly, dirty, nasty, and old fashioned stuff. That stuff still survives if you look for it. And for him, and for most of his fans, that's kind of a kind of a positive thing. Maybe it's really in the modern world, and he's not anti-modernity in the way that maybe some of the things I'm going to talk about in a minute are, but there, there's these like little cul-de-sacs in which perhaps you can escape from modernity. So he's using the early modern monster, the yokai, as this symbol of perhaps escape from modernity, right? This fun, pleasurable, old-fashioned, even if it's grimy, rundown, and smelly, and, and maybe scary and gross, alternative to modernity. I'm going to skip a little bit more of what I want to say about him and finish off um, by talking about a couple of animated movies since we're in the... Um, I'll be talking about animation a little bit. So probably most of you have heard of Studio Ghibli, the great Hayao Miyazaki. Uh, I wanted to finish off by looking at a couple of uses of yokai, of really modern monsters, in films by this studio. So the Studio Ghibli Studio is Japan's preeminent um, animation studio. It's you know, worldwide famous since they got their distribution deal with Disney in the early 21st century. Um, it's had other directors working for it, but the company was founded and for most of its history guided by two directors. Miyazaki Hayao, who's the one who's been much more famous in the West, but his senior partner was a fellow named Takahata Isao. I say was because the future of Ghibli is a little bit clouded right now. But these two directors, for most of Ghibli's history, would kind of alternate making films. And um, I'm going to show you just a little bit of one film by each of these. Um, they each use early modern monsters in their own way. I'm going to show you a little bit from one of um, Takahata's called Pumpoko, which is about coming, and a little bit from Spirited Away, uh, which is one of the documents. Spirited Away is by far more famous in English 
and Honpoko is. Um, both of them are inheriting Mizuki Shigeru's use of yokai. In fact, they're, they're little homages to Mizuki Shigeru tucked into these works if you watch them very carefully. Um, let's start with Spirited Away, even though that's a little bit later. Um, this came out in 2001, directed by Miyazaki. Um, many of you might have seen this. I'm not going to talk about it too much. It's kind of an Alice in Wonderland sort of pastiche in a way. So a girl from modern Japan, um, she and her parents are, well, she basically slips into an alternate universe full of weird and magical creatures. Well, that's the Alice in Wonderland aspect. So she and her parents are moving to a new suburb. Along the way, they stop at what looks like an amusement park. Um, her parents sort of are suddenly enchanted and turned into swine, and she's swallowed up in this fantasy world where she has to save them. This particular fantasy world is characterized by this huge Edo period style public bathhouse patronized by monsters and gods. She has to work here and she sees this parade of these, these spooks and monsters go by every night when they come to patronize the bathhouse. I'm just going to show you a little bit from, I actually have to put the DVD in, from where she first sees these monsters arrive. Okay, we're gonna stop there. Um, I just wanted to give you a flavor of how he's working in. In Miyazaki's world, he's characterizing these more as gods than as monsters, but if we recall, there's not a real bright line between those kind of things in the world of yokai. And it's pretty clear from the architecture and the way that they're dressed that he's meaning is to think about these in kind of a fantasized early modern way. What to say about this? We'll come back to here just a little bit. I wish I had more time to talk about this film, but you know, it's clear that he's bringing in traditional so-called monsters in a traditional setting. The fact that this is taking place in a Tokyo suburb, right? We're sort of back in Mizuki territory. We've got a survival of a kind of fantasized early modern past right in the midst of the megalopolis. And if you see more of Miyazaki's works, um, Princess Mononoke is another good example. He's really concerned with kind of a survival of divinity into the modern age. He's really concerned with sort of fantasizing about or exploring the roots of Japanese uh, conceptions of godhood, of divinity in nature. And this seems to be in line with that. So it seems to be kind of a positive um, use of yokai, for example. A positive use of yokai, perhaps. Um, to represent a persistence of ancient spirituality, which is kind of different than the way they were used in the past. He's kind of reifying these into a tradition, right? He's trying, he's kind of saying that, that yokai are the tradition, capital T, and we can celebrate them as getting in touch with our spiritual roots as Japanese. Um, I'm going to rush on to one last clip, which I think is um, going to wrap things up nicely. We can contrast Miyazaki's kind of positive, almost spiritualist view of yokai with his uh, colleague Takata in this uh, from 1994. So this is basically an environmental fable um, in which a colony of tanuki, these badger-like shape-shifting creatures, are threatened by spreading suburbs. And so they organize to attack the construction workers using their shape-shifting skills. Sounds like a nice children's story. I think Takata is in many ways a much more interesting filmmaker than Miyazaki because Takata is never satisfied to just tell a simple children's story. He's always trying to stretch the limits of what an animated movie can do and the kind of audience it can speak to and the kind of issues it can raise, which I think will be pretty clear when I show you the first of these clips when he's talking about the development of this Tokyo suburb. The way he's describing it is not what your average 10 year old is interested in. I'm going to show you a clip establishing the development and then the first action that the Tanuki take to oppose this development. But the last detail that he included in the, uh, the news report, I think is, is a tip off to, I don't know, it's part of why I love Takata, the fact that people die. Right? I mean, that's not your average show story sort of thing. You, know, you would expect if this was really into kids, it would be, you know, the, the workers were unharmed, there's this huge crash in the truck, but he escaped unharmed. But people died. These times he killed people in their resistance. He's actually trying to get us to think about real life resistance. It was not so long before this. Well into the 1980s, there was a, a sort of armed, all that kind of resistance movement to the expansion of the new airport in Narita. 
there was sort of armed resistance, this was kind of in some ways the last stand of the well-known radical movements of the late 60s in Japan, which took lives, which saw bombs, which, which engaged in terrorist activities around the world. He sort of needs to think about that in the person of these, I don't know, I love this image here, this is around the end. He's positioning these yokai, not just as a pleasant escape from modernity, and not as this sort of wonderful survival of traditional divinity. He's positioning them as kind of a metaphor for everything that the development of modern Japan is threatening. They could be stamped out. We could lose this aspect of the past, but also as a site of resistance to Mary. This time he in human form standing there flagging down the truck, right? Is he William of Buckley's man standing at Fort Street yelling stop? Or is he an eco terrorist? What are these Tanaki doing? Whatever they're doing, they're figures of resistance, right? In the context of this children's story. So that's something we don't see in the early modern period. In all of these cases, with Mizuki, with Miyazaki, with Takata, we're seeing their very traditionalness, their very oldness being mobilized as part of how they're being used in modern Japanese popular culture. They're being used to say something about the past and how the past relates to it. Anybody else with questions now? Okay, yeah, any? So, um, I always, when I watch Spirit of the Woman, yeah. um, oh. I do see some messages in there about the environment and also about, um, there's sort of a multiple themes of not um, being satisfied with where you're at and not. Having started with the of swine, yeah. and then there are multiple other yeah, pieces yeah. through the story where there's a lot of more. Environmental consciousness, yeah. Environmental consciousness is huge in all of the Ghibli films. It's a huge theme for Miyazaki, going back to the one that he really made his reputation on the Shimane Nausicaa, which is this sort of post environmental apocalypse sort of fable. Um, I think as he goes later, in his career, you start to get the sense with him that, um, or even in Naushika, you get the sense that nature is going to survive no matter what. The question is whether people are going to survive or whether nature is going to survive in a way that's hospitable to people. And when he starts to mobilize history into this, you start to get the sense of a transcendence. Right? Princess Mononoke is a, is a great example. We have like sort of quasi-historical circumstances being depicted, but also a sort of divinity which is too strong for humans to really make much of a difference to either the way. And that's kind of the way I read Spirited Away, which is my favorite of his movies by far. Um, there's this, it's like there's this survival or this, this way in which traditional, I mean, I think he would call it traditional, and right? I don't want to use that word, but I think he would call it traditional spirituality is still there and is still accessible no matter what happens in modern Tokyo, which is like the diametric opposite of what Takata said. Right? At the end of Pompoko, the Tanuki are either extinct or forced to live permanently shape-shifted as humans. There is no way for them to survive in their traditional society in modern Japan. That's a very bleak, sort of non-children story-ish kind of outlook.